Father, Lord, we love you, and we praise you this morning, and uh, we ask you to come with us and join us in this ceremony now, Lord. Please be with us. Let our music and our singing bring glory to you and honor to you and pleasure to you. Let our offerings bring glory to you and honor to you and be used to further your kingdom. Bless our speaker. Let the truth of your word ring true through his words today, Lord. And I pray, Lord, today for the brokenhearted that are in our midst. Let them cling to the truth of the gospel that is the only thing that can save us and strengthen us daily, Lord. We love you. Pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. You may take a seat this morning. I'm looking for Gwen and Jennifer. Where are Gwen and Jennifer? Gwen and Jennifer. Yes, come on ahead. If you folks are just come share your testimony, introduce yourself, and then share the testimony, and you'll speak into that black mic right there. Hi, my name is Guinevere. Most people call me Gwen. I've been coming to Berean services for nearly a year. This church and its members have been a great blessing to me. I want to tell you about my conversion from a sinner to a believer in Je Jesus Christ. I endured a lot of pain and hurt growing up as I was raised in an abusive environment and a dysfunctional family. As a child, my family attended a Baptist church. In the children's Sunday school, I learned of the love the Lord had for me, but it was the love of the Father that kept me in doubt. I guess it was because I didn't understand the doctrine of reconciliation at this young age. The majority of the teachings in my church was on sin and hell's fires. From my childhood, I knew I was a sinner as I placed the sins and abuse I endured as a child upon myself. I carried the fears, shame, guilt, and pain of the abuse. I also began to hold on to deep, hurtful, and angry feelings in my soul. One night as I was looking out of my bedroom window with tears in my eyes, I said, Lord, I have these very strong, uncomfortable, and negative emotions in my soul. Lord, I know these emotions are not of you, but they dwell within me. They often overwhelm me. I just didn't like the way I felt inside. I said, Lord, I know and believe that only you can remove these emotions in me. I'm sorry I have these emotions that I have no control over. Although these emotions remained in me for some years, my repent of heart over my anger and the other emotions in my soul made a difference for me, a difference between life and death. As I stared out my bedroom window, the voice of the Lord spoke to me. He said, I am with you always. These words eased my troubled soul. These words gave me, gave me the true faith in Jesus 
and they enabled me to continue in my faith in God over the years. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, but I knew he was going to work things out. I was baptized about a year later. I later grabbed hold of uh, Romans 8.28, which says, all, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This scripture gives me much comfort today. It didn't feel like it then, but in that moment, the Lord gave me a new heart of love and compassion. The faith imparted to me as a child in my bedroom window changed my life. I realized I was born again. One question I've had since I was born again is the assurance of salvation. This is because my life had been full of struggles. I received this assurance as I began uh, coming to this service. I recently got involved in the Christianity Explored uh, meeting. I believe it was like on our last meeting, we were just sitting at the table. Dan told me, he said, one question he gets the most from believer is assurance of salvation. Then he said, well, the fact that you're in the struggle tells you that you are saved. I, I sighed a great sigh of relief. As I said, Berean is a, has been a great blessing to me. I had begun to believe churches documented in the books of Acts no longer existed. This is when God led me here to Berean, a church full of love. I had also begun to believe that there are no longer any Christians who walk in the fruit of the Spirit. That is, until I met Pastor Terry and his lovely wife, Michelle. For me, they are excellent examples of love, humility, and grace. Qualities I've never seen operating in one person. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen. <clears throat> um, growing up, I was raised in a Christian family, and I had Christian friends and was involved in church. Um, I knew the general facts about the Bible and Christ and sin, and I considered myself Christian. Um, when I moved from home to attend college, I still believed this, and I would pray and try to live by Christian principles. Uh, however, I did not actively involve myself in church. Uh, my focus was on academics and security from a future, a future occupation. My attitude uh, then towards God was more... Uh, pray if I get too stressed, but lacked thanksgiving and praise and actually listening. I knew to ask Jesus to forgive my sins, but was, was without real repentance. Uh, the summer of my last year of grad school, I worked at a Christian children's camp and was asked to give an end-of-the-week message. Uh, God put a topic on my heart, and while I was studying and preparing for that uh, talk, um, he began to get me thinking about my apathetic school lifestyle and my lack of listening and responding to him. Uh, during the last semester of my school, God led me to a campus Bible study uh, where we studied Philippians, and I saw the absence of the life in Christ that I thought I had. Uh, around the same time, I gained a car and started to regularly attend my home church again. Uh, in addition to the Bible study, uh, through the sermons preached at my home church, um, God impressed upon me the emptiness in my life and the weight of my sin and inability to do anything about that myself. I understood uh, Sir Nurse Jesus to be the only thing that I could do. Um, I repented of my sin, and I desired to seek him and increase um, in knowledge of him. I was baptized a while later in that church, um, and I am blessed with seeing how God is working in my life daily. And I have been growing in relationship with him and through more constant prayer and thanksgiving, um, and have been given grace to hear and be corrected by his word. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the elders, of course, are recommending uh, that, uh, making the motion that we invite Gwen Sams and Jennifer Fox into our membership. Is there a second? Uh, over here, uh, Eric, ba uh, Eric Bowditch, second. Thank you. All in favor, say amen. amen. At the
Our reading today is from 2 Corinthians 12, 11 through 21. I have been a fool. You force me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not all at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were reformed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here, for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I have seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for upbuilding and beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again in my God, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. Every Christmas Eve, my family has a tradition that we come to the <coughs> Christmas Eve candlelight service here, and then we go home and we have some goodies, and uh, the kids who are home uh, open a, or maybe we'll do it by Skype, uh, will open a gift, the gift that they get from the other kids, the kids gift we call it, and uh, then we'll go downstairs and we'll put on a Christmas carol. Uh, by, uh, done by George C. Scott, which is the best one ever done, by the way. You'll understand that. My brother disagrees with me on that, but uh, he, he'll come around one of these days. Uh, but uh, in that uh, movie, in that story, Jacob Marley comes on Christmas Eve. And, uh, of course, this is very disconcerting to Ebenezer Scrooge. And he begins to complain to Marley about his visit. And he asks, why do spirits walk the earth? Why have you come to haunt me? And the answer that comes from Marley is, it is for your sake I have come, Ebenezer. It's a touching sentiment from one suffering so much yet wanting to forestall the suffering of others. Well, this passage drips with Paul's concern for the Corinthians. Throughout it, Paul might be saying, as Jacob Marley, it is for your sake, Corinthians, it is for your sake that I have said and done what I have. He says several times in the passage that he did not burden them, verse 13, verse 14, verse 16. Of what was Paul speaking well, he was talking about the fact that he had preached the gospel to them free of charge back in chapter 11, uh, verses 7 through 9. He had talked about that. He said, listen, I robbed other churches. I took offerings from other churches. Sometimes they sent to my needs, but I would not charge you for preaching the gospel that was so unlike these other false teachers, these super apostles, right, who were, who were taking the money. They wanted the money. That's, that was their prestige. That was their payment. And Paul said, I was not like that. He tells them, I will gladly spend and be spent for you, verse 15. He says, I never took advantage of you. 
When I sent Titus to you, when I said the brother who is famous uh, for, uh, for preaching the gospel, I, I, we, we didn't take advantage of you in that. We were not deceitful in that. He says, everything we have said and done is for your sake, for your edification, for your building up, verse 19. You know, isn't it true that our sinfulness makes us selfish people? It's really unavoidable. The most seemingly unselfish among us still reeks of self. But still, the gospel makes and enables sinful men like Paul and like us so that we are able to a great extent with the proper motive being the help and the good of those to whom we minister. How many times might we really be able to say in the course of a day, in the course of a week, in the course of a month, what I am doing, I am doing sacrificially for the sake of others. Aren't our lives mostly consumed with doing things for ourselves? We have personal goals and we spend a lot of time in personal care, uh, fulfilling personal responsibilities, personal pleasures that we live out. Our lives are mostly consumed with self, are they not? Now listen, of necessity, it must be like this. If we're going to survive and function, our lives will be predominantly consumed with these kinds of issues. But that necessity often turns into a sinful tendency to be self-absorbed in most, if not all, of life. And the Christian call is a call to selflessness and living first of all for God and then for others. And this is very difficult for us. But Christ came and he did all for the sake of others. And he is the model and example that we are to follow. Listen to some of these verses about Christ. John 17, 19, And for their sake, Father, I consecrated myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. For their sake, Jesus said. 2 Corinthians 5, 15, And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sake he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. 1 Peter 1, 20, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake. Paul, then, purposes to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and do what he did in terms of ministry for the sake of others. Now, in this passage, and we're only going to look at the first couple of verses here today, and, and Lord willing, we'll take up the rest of them next week. But in these, in these verses, in this passage, Paul underscores three for your sake Actions that he undertook on behalf of the Corinthian people. Difficult people, by the way. But for your sake, actions. I want to just look at the first one of them this morning, and it is this. I have been a fool for your sake, Paul says. Verses 11 through 13. How? How had Paul been a fool for their sake? Well, he did so by commending himself by means of this sanctified boasting he had done in the previous passage. Paul should not have to have done this. The Corinthians should have done this. If they would have been upright and if they had been uh, uh, compliant and if they would have recognized his apostolic authority rather than questioning, and, uh, questioning it because of these false teachers that had risen in Corinth. They would have done it themselves. But that forced him now to play the fool, to combat the foolishness of the false apostles who were sinfully boasting of their spiritual authority and downplaying Paul's. But if he was being a fool, he was doing it for their 
sake. Now, Paul gives a couple of ways here that he had been foolish for their sake. First of all, he defended his apostleship in verses 11 and 12. I've been a fool, he said. You forced me into it, but I've been a fool. In verses 11 and 12, Paul claimed here that he was not inferior in any way to these super apostles. The Corinthians were starting to think that he was. They were being convinced that that Paul was weak and that Paul was vacillating and that Paul was unauthoritative and all of these things. And Paul says, look, I I am in no way inferior to these super apostles. Now, a few commentators hold that Paul is alluding uh, to the 12 apostles here, Peter, James, John, and the others. Calvin, for instance, believed that what Paul was saying is that he had, he had as much authority and was no way inferior to Peter and James and John and what have you. But almost all commentators today, as, we're, as well as nearly every modern translation, understands that the context here demands that what Paul is talking about are the false teachers at Corinth that were claiming to be apostles. So what Paul is saying is that as a fool, he defended his apostleship to them in the face of these false teachers, and Paul upbraids them by telling them, I ought to have been commended by you. False apostles were plentiful, in the early church. Those who were claiming to be apostles, they were hanging, hitching their wagon, so to speak, on the apostles, claiming apostleship. And the same is true today. It is not hard to find those today who are claiming the office of apostle. They most often do so to leverage their followers to recognize their unquestioned authority and their worthiness to be effusively supported financially. So the question needs to be, not only in Paul's day, but in our day as well, in our day right now, are there those that legitimately hold the New Testament office of apostle today? And the answer to that is no. For several reasons. I want to share those reasons with you. First of all, because of the special qualifications of the office of apostle. There were some very specific New Testament qualifications for the office of apostle. The word apostle means messenger or delegate. It's used in different ways in the New Testament. In his paper on this subject, Pastor David Merrick of Reformed Baptist Church in Grand Rapids puts forth the concept that there is a distinction between a big A apostle and a little a usage of the word apostle. A big A usage of the term speaks of the office of apostle or one holding that office. A small A usage of the term is applied to some in the New Testament, but it denotes the function of being a messenger or a delegate, not the position of being one of the big A apostles. We use the term elder the same way, don't we? We might say that the office of elder is a biggie elder, all right? And, and then when we see the word elder in a, in a, little, a, a little e sense, it's speaking of an older person or somebody with maturity. We deacon the same way. When, when we use a big D uh, designation for uh, uh, the, uh, the Greek word for, uh, for deacon, then we are... Uh, we are talking about the office of the deacon. But that same word, which means servant, uh, 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 is used of other people to describe the function of a servant rather than the office of deacon. Well, the same is true when we come to the word apostle. There's a big A designation of the word, and then there's a little a designation of the word as well. But what were the qualifications for the office of apostle, the big A uh, uh, apostle. Well, let me share a couple of them with you. In order to be one of the 12, one had to have accompanied Jesus all the time that he went in and out among his disciples. From approximately the time of his baptism, the time of his ascension. This was important in the 
uh, in the, if the apostle was to be qualified, he was to be an eyewitness and an ear witness of Christ's resurrection and all that he did. Remember in Acts chapter 1, there, where they're replacing Judas? Well, they did that uh, because they recognized that in order to be one of the 12, somebody, and in this case it happened to be Matthias, uh, had been with them the whole time. Sometimes we get the picture in the New Testament that there were just 12 guys, and they were the only ones that were following Jesus around. That's not the case. There were many other disciples who followed Jesus around, but there was only 12 of them uh, who made up the 12. Matthias was one of those individuals who was connected consistently with the ministry and the teaching and all of the things about the Lord Jesus, saw his resurrection, saw his ascension and all of those things, and, uh, and he became the replacement for Judas. So they had to have accompanied Jesus during his earthly ministry. The second qualification was there had to be an, a direct appointment by Jesus Christ if one was to be recognized as a big A apostle. Now, this, this was underscored in the selection of Matthias. Did you ever wonder why they chose Matthias, between Matthias and, and the other brother? Did, you know why they chose? They cast lots. Doesn't that seem strange to you? You know, they flipped a coin. They, they rolled the dice, right? Why did they do that? Why didn't they deliberate, and, and, and why didn't they then, you know, there were, there were 11 apostles there, nice odd number. They could have voted, right? It wouldn't have been a draw. Uh, they could have, and, and the majority would have won. Why didn't they do that? Do you, is that the way we should choose elders today? We got a couple of opportunities here. This guy's as good as this guy. Well, let's, let's flip a coin, right? Why don't we just flip a coin? Let, why don't we do that today? The reason they did that is so that by his sovereign choice, the Lord could appoint Matthias. They wanted the Lord to, they didn't want to appoint Matthias. They didn't want to deliberate as to his qualifications and, and whether he should be the guy or not. They wanted the Lord to appoint him. Well, a third qualification was a big A apostle was the recipient of a supernatural endowment of the Holy Spirit, which was given for a couple of reasons. We read about this in Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 8. Uh, here shortly Jesus said, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria, uh, Judea and Samaria and to the other parts of the earth. Well, this Holy Spirit endowment and I enabled them to supernaturally be witnesses of Christ so that they in, inerrantly spoke and recorded the word of God by divine inspiration. Their role, the role of the 12 was going to be to compile the New Testament to identify what New Testament scripture was. There's a reason why the canon was closed by the end of the first century. That's because it was at the end of the first century that the last apostle alive, John, went on to glory. And so there were no more apostles who were supernaturally endowed to record Scripture and to determine the canon of the New Testament, the limits of the New Testament, if you will. They oversaw all the writing of the New Testament books that we have in the New Testament. Now, they didn't write them all because Mark wrote one, right? And Luke wrote two. But, but these men were closely associated and under the supervision of an apostle. And so there is that supernatural ability to do that that Jesus had promised them back in John chapter 15. The Holy Spirit will come into you and you will remember all things whatsoever I've taught you. Now who could do that without a supernatural power of the Holy Spirit? Well, this is, this is, this is a power that that they had and the other thing that they had across uh, along with this power was the ability to work miracles they work miracles the supernatural holy spirit endowment enabled them to back up their testimony with supernatural signs and wonders these signs and wonders attached themselves to the apostles because 
because they supported, these miracles supported their divinely inspired witness. By the way, I, I, I do believe that Acts 1.8 has an ancillary, you know, you should be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit will come back, you should be my witness. I believe that that has an ancillary application to the church today. It's legitimate for us to say, yeah, we, this is what we do. We, we're, we're to take the God, like the apostles did. But directly, that was a promise to the apostles. The apostles fulfilled Acts 1.8. If none of us ever fulfilled Acts 1-8, the apostles did. And what were they? They were this supernatural, this Holy Spirit-endowed group of men that provided the human witness and testimony of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostles ended what we call redemptive history. Once their human testimony, after the resurrection of Christ, what more was needed? The only thing that was needed was this human, supernatural testimony. Once they fulfilled that, redemptive history was closed. We are in what theologians now call the, uh, the, uh, the order of salvation. We are working out salvation. The, the, what has been redemptive history, we are now working out. We are in the order of salvation. And so these were special men. They were given special abilities. And Paul says, along with the other apostles in verse 12 here, that this was true of his apostolic office. He said, the signs of a true apostle, not like these false apostles here in Corinth, but, but the, the sign of a true apostle were performed among you. The writer of Hebrews includes these as apostolic equipment when he writes in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness with both signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, and so on and so forth. MacArthur writes that miracles are not normative for all periods of church history. That, they are, 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 that, they, that miracles are not normative for all periods of church history should be obvious from Paul's designation of them as signs of an apostle. If they were commonplace, they would hardly have distinguished the apostles from ordinary believers. It was their rarity as well as their u- unusual extent that made them definitive signs of the apostles. So we clearly see that there were special qualifications for one to be a big A apostle. And those qualifications can't be met today. A second reason why this office does not exist today is because it was a foundational office, not a continuing one. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I tell you, you are Peter, you're a small rock, and upon this massive bedrock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, a foundation is not perpetually built. Once it is laid, a superstructure is built. Well, the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone laid that foundation. And the church down through history has been that superstructure that God has been building, still building it today. And so the office of apostle was foundational, not continuing. Here's a third reason this office does not exist today. The apostles, including Paul, were directly appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Give you several references there. Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders of the ministry which he received from the Lord Jesus. He received it from the Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. At his conversion, Paul said, for this purpose I have appeared, or Jesus, I should say, for this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness. Acts 26, 16. For these reasons and more, We conclude that the office of apostle was limited to the 12 and Paul himself who wrote, and last of all, he was seen of me. Paul said, he was seen of me as one born out of due time, for I am least of the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15, 8 and 9. 
And then finally, a fourth reason is the apostles were promised a unique place of honor in the future. Matthew 19, 27, Jesus says, Truly I say unto you, to his disciples who became the apostles, when the Son of Man will sit on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In Revelation 21, 14, John, speaking about the heavenly Jerusalem, says, And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. While Paul is not a, a, a one of the 12, he will doubtless hold a place of honor in the kingdom as he was an apostle born out of due time and held that office. But the stringent requirements for the apostolic office are such that only the 12 and Paul qualified. Well, these claims of these false apostles, these super apostles were false claims. But Paul was so concerned for their sake that they were being led astray by them, he became a fool. And he boasted of his own legitimate apostleship, pointing out the difference between him and them. Well, there's a second way in which Paul was willing to be a fool for their sake. He did not burden them, verse 13. Again, all this burden talk goes back to the fact that when Paul came into Corinth, he did not take financial support from the Corinthians. The term burden in this passage is kind of a shorthand uh, for uh, referring to the fact that Paul preached the gospel to them uh, free of charge. Now, we're not sure why Paul would not do this, perhaps because Corinth was filled with, with these... Uh, uh, religious charlatans and and in the day of course uh, the more money you demanded as a religious teacher the more prestige you had and Paul would not take money and some of them turned that back against Paul and said Paul you don't even take money I mean what kind of apostle are you these guys over here we're paying them top dollar they're worth it but, but you won't even take money for preaching the gospel and so maybe that's the reason that Paul uh, did that. Maybe he didn't want to be lumped in with the television evangelists. You know, any, any gospel preacher worth his salt doesn't want to be lumped in with the infamous television evangelists of our day. And maybe that was Paul's desire. And Paul says, listen, did I, even though I would not take money from you, were you serviced any less than any of the other churches? What, did I? La did you lack any attention from me? Did did I hold back from you? Did I shortchange you because I would not take remuneration? I would not take pay for preaching you. The well, of course not. Paul's tenure there in uh, in Corinth was eighteen months. That was the second longest tenure that he had of any church coming behind uh, the church at Ephesus uh, where he was for three years. To our knowledge, he corresponded more with the church at Corinth than any other church at least four times, only two of which are scripturated, but two others that are referred to within First and Second Corinthians. He dealt with their problems more than any other church. So Paul was saying, look, even though I would not preach the gospel for pay, you weren't shortchanged, were you? And then Paul makes an interesting statement. He says of his refusal to take money, forgive me this wrong. Forgive me this wrong. Now, most commentators, and it's totally legitimate, most commentators say what Paul was doing there is he was being a little smarmy, he was being a little sarcastic, he was being a, a bit in your face about it. The other view is that he was actually serious. That he had come to the conclusion that his not taking support, financial support from them, had not helped them. Had, had not been the best thing for them. That perhaps had they been engaged in supporting him financially. Well, Regardless of which is the case, this was part of Paul's foolishness. 
Because 1 Corinthians 9 said he would rather die than give up this ground for boasting. That is, his being able to say he preached the gospel to them for free. Well, we need to stop our exposition here for today. Pick it up next time, Lord willing, and conclude this message. But Paul would have the Corinthians to know that the first action he undertook to prove to them that everything he did was for your sake was that he was willing to play the fool in order to protect them from the false teachers. Now, I'd like to share just one insight before we close and then culminate with a challenge. Here's the insight. Our brotherly relationships take on a new and heightened meaning when we have a for-your-sake ethic. Paul had had a deep relationship with the church which he treasured. It led him to desire to do all for their sake. Yet he endured much at the hands of the Corinthians. If if it had been for his own sake, he would have abandoned them long ago. But realizing they were flawed sinners, coupled with the heart intent of doing all for their sake, gave him a different perspective. What what was some of the different perspective that that came to Paul because he was ministering for their sake? Well, one of the things was it gave him long-suffering patience with them. Can you imagine if we were in Paul's position? Can you imagine we probably would have said, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya, as soon as they showed us some of the lack of respect and disloyalty that they showed to Paul. But not only did Paul stick with them, he loved them more and more. It's kind of like that of a parent who sticks with his rebellious child and thankless child far beyond what would seem reasonable, and their pitiful love for them actually grows during that time. Are we this way with our brothers and sisters that don't treat us the way that they should treat us? Or do we cut them off disassociate ourselves from them. Think of how God is long-suffering and patient with us. Do you know why? It is for our sake. Now, I know he does it primarily for his glory as he does all things, but Christ did what he did for our sake. And when we come to the place that we are acting more for your sake than we are for our sake, we begin to model Christ. We begin to model the gospel. But then secondly, this attitude also gave Paul a sacrificial spirit. Paul was willing to forgo his own pride, his own financial gain, his own personal feelings and comfort in order to minister for their sake. How this needs to be and inform needs to be a dynamic and inform our church relationships with one another in the body of Christ. How different might our church dynamic be if each had the Pauline ethic of for your sake? What am I talking about? What am I talking about? Well, have you ever have you ever considered serving in some way or attending something you otherwise would not attend or doing something you would otherwise not do simply for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, our our missions conference is coming up here in a few weeks and we have always enjoyed very good attendance to that. The Bereans have supported that wonderfully both in their attendance and their involvement and their giving and, uh, but what would, what would it be like if for a church that ministers to over 500 people that we would have a missions conference and only a few people would show up? How would the missionaries feel about that? Would you ever consider being a part of and joining in the missions conference, not because you're interested, you're not particularly interested, you'd you'd rather sit at home at night, it's not that you really want to do it, but your thought is for their sake, for the sake of others, I'm going to be there. You may not even feel you need it. 
You can do without it. But for the sake of others, you're going to be there. Have you ever thought of coming to a members meeting on a Sunday night simply for the sake of others? I mean, you don't, you, you don't feel like you need to come. You know what's going on in the church. You don't need to vote whether or not we're going to put new paper dispensers in the bathroom, right? Uh, they don't, it's not essential that I be there. Well, have you ever thought of coming just to be an encouragement to that one who's given a ministry report that night? Be an encouragement to your leadership to be engaged in the administration of the church to fill a quorum so that the vote can be taken so that the ministry, the administrative work of the church can go on. I don't need to sit and talk about the administration. Let them do what they want. Look, do you do it because do you come to a meeting or not come to a meeting simply because you take the attitude, well, what's in it for me? There's nothing here for me. Why should I be a part of this? Have you ever thought of just coming to be a source of strengthening to someone with whom you might pray that night or just to lift up the arms of a brother or sister in Christ who is faltering at this time? Isn't it true, when we think about it, isn't it true? We usually determine our involvement, not always, but, but it, is, it is common for us to determine our involvement in church by that standard. What's in it for me? What's in it for my family? It, you know, it, it doesn't seem to pertain to me. It doesn't seem to hinge on me. Well, living for the sake of others has many applications but it is as we move away from the ethic of me and mine to the ethic of for your sake, that's when we begin to model the gospel. Because Christ, our Savior, for our sake, endured the cross, despising the shame, and became obedient even to death, that we might be saved. When we live for your sake, that's when we begin to live gospel-centered lives, and our brotherly relationships take on new meaning when we do so. Well, please stand with me, if you will, and receive this benediction. Just a couple of verses to share with you. Uh, as a prelude to this benediction, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, Therefore, Paul writes, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. Dear brothers and sisters, let us no longer live for ourselves, but for the sake of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us no longer live for ourselves, but for the sake of one another, that we might model the gospel. Let us leave this place committed to each other and the cause of the gospel that weaves our hearts together. So go in peace. Amen. I want to invite our new members here to the front, Jennifer and Gwen, and uh, come and greet them and welcome them into the membership, won't you?